how about it, boys? Bet you all want to do more than slap a cat. The fucking Bucktooth cartoon dreamed up by some asshole on Madison Avenue in the South Soul. Now let me tell you something. The Jap I know, the Japanese soldier, he has been at war since you were in fucking diapers! Back to the channel, I'm your host, the Talking Balaclava. Today we're going over the BAR, the Browning Automatic Rifle. This thing is a tank of a gun and it is iconic. I guarantee you, if you're not a big gun person, chances are you have known this gun and or have played with this gun in some AAA or indie video game. You have seen this thing in movies. It is an iconic weapon of pop culture. I know I say that a lot about a lot of guns on here because I like to get very cool weapons on administrative results. So this thing is awesome and we're gonna dive on in. But before we go any further, we of course have to talk about our Patreon. If you wanna support the channel in any way, shape or form, Patreon is an excellent way to support the channel as well as merchandise. It really does help out because I'm gonna be honest, there was a lot of 30 odd six expended in this video. And uh, it's like holding bricks of gold when you hold these mags. It hurts is what I'm trying to say. But don't feel bad for me because I had more fun than you can shake a stick at. We of course also have to thank the sponsors of this video, which is going to be Americana Pipe Dream Apparel. What you're seeing me wearing right now, at least the camo, is all thanks to AP. We'll go over the uniform, maybe on the second channel, more in depth. Joe, we of course also have to thank AAC Ammo, America's Ammunition Company, for being the ammo sponsor of the channel. Now, they didn't get me any 30 on 6 for this video, but they have been supplying me with a plethora of fantastic rounds. So, big thank you to those guys, and they have been helping out greatly, and they can help you guys out greatly as well. So, a big thank you to AAC Mega Based. Now, if you're very unfamiliar with the BAR whatsoever, a quick crash course is this gun was developed by John Moses Browning, a very well-renowned firearms designer that gave us essentially the, the modern world bleeding edge tech for its time. This gun is over 100 years old, still is very cutting edge for what it is, especially back in the day. Now, of course, more modern guns easily replace this thing as time went on, but for what it is and when it came out, this was seen as a very high-tech weapon. So essentially the concept behind it is that it takes a 20-round box-fed magazine. In a world of bolt-action rifles, this thing was a king. It was initially designed to be used in World War I with trench warfare, and they had hopes of using these in a grand-scale offensive to overwhelm the Germans. Now, these saw limited use in World War I, and then kind of sat around in that interim period between World War I and World War II. Now, fun fact, these actually saw a lot of use amongst law enforcement and bank robbers. So just for a quick disclaimer, I'm doing a brief glance over and not diving into too many of the variations. There's actually a wide plethora of variations. And also keep in mind, I'm a dude on the internet that wears a ball of clava, so take everything I do and say with a grain of salt. Now, during that interim between World War I and World War II with the bank robbers and police using BARs, there was this time when a lot of the bank robbers were picking up these surplus BARs that were floating around. My boy Clyde, he prefers a Browning Automatic 30 cal. Back in the good old days, you could walk into a hardware store and pick up a BAR for around, what, $3,500 today? Now, I could be wrong about that. They may have also stolen BARs from Armory, so it all could be from the all general above. But what matters the most importantly is that the criminals did end up with BARs and they were outgunning law enforcement drastically. Imagine you're some cop back in the day and you're having to deal with a criminal and you have a six shooter and some criminal pops out with a sawed off BAR. Nope. 20 rounds of 30-06. I used to be a cop. Trust me, if someone said, hey, you have to go fight someone 
with a BAR with your stick shooter, I'd say, hey, how about I just fight you instead? That's not happening. So they did eventually arm law enforcement with BARs to help counter out that firepower disparity. And then of course, some politics got involved and ruined it for the rest of us with the NFA laws and all that. So big thank you to the 30s, I guess. You guys really did it, did it for us. Thanks for the tax stamps. Yay. Don't shoot, let them burn. This is also a private range, so we can do this. Now, getting into World War II, the BAR kind of comes into its stride, being used a lot more throughout the duration of the war. And we kind of get to this particular rifle. So you can see there's, there's going to be a slight amalgamation of A1 parts. You don't have the wings right here, like on the A2. But for the most part, the rest of the furniture is going to be A2 stuff. Now, this is going to be a Winchester 1918 gun. This was sent over to the British as part of the Lend-Lease Act. And we believe this was used with the Home Guard. And then Nick even said, spoiler, he even said that this has a Korean War era barrel. But, you know, this isn't my firearm, guys. I am not the expert on this gun. I am just an admirer. So, of course, we always have to thank Nick. Get over here. Thanks for coming back on the channel, brother. Yeah. Nick, now this is your BAR. You want to tell me a little bit about it? Sure. Well, it is a transferable BAR. Uh, I acquired this one about, I don't know, about four years ago. And this falls into the category of I wish it could talk. Uh, it is a Winchester 1918 uh, production. Of course, all the Winchesters were blued. This is now Parkerized. So I have my theories. Uh, I believe it went to World War I. It came back. I think it went to Britain under Lend-Lease. There are two uh, British stamps on the barrel. I mean, on the receiver and on the bolt. And it has a Korean uh, War manufacturer barrel on it. So basically, it's probably been to three different places that I can think of. France, Korea, and uh, Britain. It's, uh, it's an iconic uh, weapon. I've been dying to say this. And it's got a great aesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. <laughs> got him. You know, it's just such a real treat to be able to have this gun out here, rocking full kit, you know, being a flat range nerd, but still you get that taste of history. So I just want to thank you for allowing us to experience that. And I get to share that with my audience who I love dearly. So well, I know they love you dearly now too. So yeah, it's really good. I, I love coming out here. I, lo I love showing uh, a bit of history off. Uh, you do every piece of history that we bring out here justice. So I try as much uh, as I and can. And everybody, I just want to say, support the channel. Buy some merch from the man. I mean, that's all there is to it. And thank you for having me out. Thank you, sir. Now, another cool thing about this BAR, it is very rare sling. So I was talking to Nick and he said that finding original World War II BAR slings is like finding unicorn tears, essentially. So I have to talk about that and do it justice real quick. Now, having shot a decent plethora of World War II weapons now in my YouTube career, I would like to talk about what it was like to run the BAR. I've, I've also run a different plethora of modern MGs as well. So you kind of get this rough baseline. So this is my first time running the BAR and I had some preconceptions and this gun met some of them, but it also took me on a different journey. So with a bipod deployed, I'm gonna try and hit some reduced size steel real quick. I got a spotter. Our unpaid intern is spotting, so let's see how we do. Hi. Yep. Right. Impact. Impact. Miss to the left. So we got some decent hits on the steel. For reference, I really can't see the silhouette with my naked eye. It kind of blends in with the backdrop. I can see the post. So I went towards the top of the post initially. Um, and then from the call outs from Jordan, my unpaid intern, he was saying that they were a little high. So I dropped her on down. And then I was putting that front sight post on slightly off to the left. So really different fun experience, especially with an open bolt weapon system such as this running it in semi-automatic, trying to make, you know, more accurate shots and just suppressive fire or into a crowd of bad guys, right? So, pretty fun. A German, a Japanese, and an Italian soldier walk into a BAR. It's only gonna get worse. When you take the carry handle and the bipod off, the gun is rather light and wieldy for what it is. And I like the idea of it when it doesn't have the bipod or carry handle because as an LMG, 
This isn't necessarily a great LMG. You can't do quick barrel swaps on this particular BAR. The bipod is horrendous as a bipod. It's very annoying to use. The carry handle is actually pretty nice. If I was a Joe back in the day, I could see myself holding onto the carry handle because the barrel system gets so hot that it gives you another option and a different way to carry the gun. As well, you can, you can hold on to the gun one hand and maybe bring some more ammo with you wherever you're going. So that's kind of nice, right? The cyclic rate on this particular BAR was actually pretty nice. This one has the semi and faster shooting setting and it actually had a very nice cyclic rate. So if I was going on the offensive and wanted to keep heads down for my rifleman to move around and get an angle on say the Japanese or the Germans or the Italians, whoever were fighting whatever conflict, then I could see that being very beneficial. Now it's important to mention along with the LARP kit that I have on that the semi-auto setting and the fast firing setting was a predominantly marine thing in the Pacific. Now the army doctrine over in Europe was essentially to issue the guns out and they had the slow fast setting and then they had the fast fast setting. But this particular model like I was saying is going to be the semi with the fast setting and that cyclic rate was actually very impressive but the downside is those 20 round mags go rather quick. I can think of another LMG used by an allied nation the Bren gun and I can think of that one for its category I think it outworks the BAR a little bit better. Still a large caliber larger capacity magazines I believe the Bren gun has a quick change barrel so overall as an LMG does Design, I like it more, especially with that large top fed magazine, because you can still get low to the ground. If you did something like that with the BAR, it's going to prop you up a little bit higher. So overall, as an LMG platform, I don't like it. But as I was saying earlier, I do like it for that aggro assaulter mindset where you have this large caliber, you have this fast fire rate, you can really lay down a lot of hate. Typically guns and alcohol don't mix. So this sets a new bar. Now, real quickly, I'm gonna go over the manual of arms in case you find yourself using a BAR one day. Chances are you've played a video game, so you should have a rough idea of how the BAR may work, but it's always good to go over it in person. So, the BAR is an open bolt weapon system, so you lock the bolt to the rear, and then to fire, you essentially have your semi and fast setting right here. This is your safety. Boop, there she goes, she fires. Now, you can see this little button protruding right here. You have to push that down to get the gun back into safe, but once you have it in safe, it stays down, so you can quickly switch it over to the firing setting. Of course, here's your trigger. Not a bad trigger. Then we have probably, arguably, the worst part about the BAR is this little button. The button ergonomically is so bad. It is so bad. I hate it with every fiber of my being. It's and makes me visibly angry. I shake and I pee my pants. It is terrible. So trying to get the magazine out of the gun is a pain in the ass. So it's almost like I think I had better luck holding onto the gun, hitting this, and then trying to drop it. Sometimes the mags will drop free, sometimes they won't. And like you have to like really get up in there depending on your firing position. It's, it's maybe it's better when it's the guns propped down on a bipod for this. But if you're like on the move, it becomes rather hard. There, oh. I got it, there we go. I could see if you were a grunt during World War II getting really good at this, getting a lot of time using it if you don't die. But overall, I think that is my biggest gripe about this particular BAR. Now the BARs did actually get better. In my H-Car video, we had Ian McCollum on and he had the best version of the BAR. He had the FND, quick change barrel, better mag release, easier to break down the receiver. Everything about that BAR was awesome. The Army in its infinite wisdom after World War I was like, nah, this BAR is fine, let's just keep going with it. <laughs> I don't know why. I would be mad if I learned about the other existing BARs and how awesome they got and I had to go fight and die with this one. I'd say, you guys, thanks Big Army, I guess. I don't know, but it's so dumb. It makes me mad, but it's still a really cool piece of history. While there's a lot of firepower, it's still not that impressive considering that the Bren gun had 30 round mags. Now fast forward to modern times where we have the advent of a, say an H-Car magazine, which for YouTube's sake, this is not a 30 round mag. This is a custom modified 29 round for YouTube. We can try it out and see what the BAR would be like if it was more uh, Brenified, if that makes sense. It doesn't, but we'll, we'll go with it. Roll with it, there are no rules. Maybe, maybe it won't work off the get-go because I just tried to send it home and did not want to feed, so. Man, that's a lot of firepower going downrange, and I do love that. Man, this thing is a beaut. Now, one thing I often think about the bar is its pop culture track record. I think of video games and I think of TV shows or movies, too. 
One particular movie I often think about that comes to mind first, and I, I you're probably thinking about the same thing, Saving Private Ryan, with Ryben rocking his BAR, that iconic beach scene. Ryben, Ryben, where's the BAR? <laughs> whoa, whoa, Ryben, Ryben. Where's your BAR? Bottom of the channel, Sarge. Bitch tried to drown me. Find a replacement. I can always think of that. I can think of the last battle when he's running around laying down his hate with the BAR. I tried doing the Ribbon run earlier, and actually the recoil knocked me off balance a little bit. Alamo, Alamo! <laughs> so when he's running and shooting, maybe he's just way better than I am, so I'll give him that. I can think of playing Battlefield 1, rocking the BAR. The, the OG version, and it was actually always a good time. So I have this little bit of nostalgia. I was playing Hell Let Loose the other day, and I was rocking the BAR, and I was trying to make some longer distance shots on some Jerry's running in the field, and the recoil was throwing me off. And I was like, there's no way it's that bad. And so getting out here, sure enough, it is that bad. The recoil is actually pretty on par in Hell Let Loose. So I'll give him that. Good job, Hell Let Loose. And then of course with TV shows, I think of, um, thinking of like Band of Brothers and the Pacific. So I feel like with Band of Brothers Pacific, I feel like the BAR is in there. I just can't remember like how iconic it is in Saving Private Ryan, if that makes sense. But overall, this is a very much a pop culture icon of World War II. So it's a very much a treat getting to be out here in full kit like this, rocking and rolling and getting to experience essentially what those soldiers that use this gun to some capacity of what it was like, at least as far as using the gear. Guaranteed, I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna sleep in a nice warm bed, and I'm gonna feel great. I'm not gonna be stuck in like some Pacific island or in some hedgerow in Europe, and I'm just gonna be loving life, right? So keep in mind, there's no like human suffering attached to it out here right now, minus maybe I'm a little bit hungry, my tummy hurts, but other than that, not too bad. Now the bar, of course, saw limited service in World War I, most of its service in World War II, Korea, and then a little bit in Vietnam, but after Vietnam, you really didn't see bars anymore unless they're being used by other countries and other conflicts as a any sort of means necessary type weapon. And that was pretty much the story of the bar. Until Ohio Ordnance made this thing called the H car. And I actually did a long video on the H car. I picked it apart some, but overall I do love this gun because it's one of my dream guns. And actually handling the BAR all day, this thing now feels like a freaking assault rifle. It's not as bad. But this thing did have some drawbacks in the video, but we won't go too in depth. Essentially, it's the same BAR receiver cut up a little bit. The BAR is a true iconic weapon of World War II and of all of other conflicts, I guess, too. We didn't really cover Korea, but they use BARs a lot there. I often think first thing is World War II. But nonetheless, if you enjoy this video, make sure you leave a comment in the comment section down below. Your comments are a sacrifice to the algorithm god, a god of what you enjoys dropping the bolt on a BAR. See you boys later. You're allowed to unsubscribe right now. I know, it's just gonna set the bar really low. <laughs> Man, I can't talk today. Oh, wow. Uh,